This is the B-Link SEI-14, a small form factor mini PC that I can almost fit in the palm of my hands. I tested a small form factor PC last year on the channel, and I was quite impressed by its capabilities, so I'm quite interested in seeing what this one from B-Link can do. We'll be putting it through various tests and benchmarks to see just how well it handles day-to-day -day tasks, productivity workloads, and even some light gaming. Let's dive into that and see if this compact powerhouse can live up to its promises. Hey, if you enjoy content like this, drop a like, make sure to subscribe, and smash that bell so you never miss another video. Hey, what is going on guys? Danny here. Welcome back to the channel and I hope you've all been doing well. Today, we're going to be looking at a mini PC that was sent over to me by B-Link. This is the SEI-14 and it appears to have some promising specs, which we'll talk more about in just a moment. Now, even though they did send me this sample to check out, this isn't a paid review or a sponsored video. All of my thoughts are mine and mine alone, along with any of my testing methodologies. Last year on the channel, we reviewed a mini PC from Geekom and I was quite impressed impressed by its capabilities. Small form factor hardware always intrigues me, and with new microarchitectures that bring advancements plus the performance improvements, these mini PCs are just going to get even better. In fact, I see a number of people these days foregoing the traditional desktop tower PC and opting for a system such as this for their daily machine. Due to the advancements in performance, it's fascinating to see just how much power can be crammed into such a small machine. With that said, using these small form factor machines, the trade-off is that you do have to pay a bit of a premium. I want to preface this video by saying these machines are targeted towards a group of consumers that want a very minimalistic setup that's quiet and efficient. So when we look at the price of the SEI-14. It currently retails for about $700 US, which is pretty much bordering what it would cost you to build an entry-level gaming PC, and is also somewhat on the higher end for the mini PC market, which has options as low as $150 to $200. However, when you look at the specifications of this machine and its design, you begin to understand that's why you're paying that premium. But I just wanted to temper your expectations, and if you're someone who's thinking, nope, that's way too much for me, I'd rather get a regular desktop, then that's great, but you're clearly not that target for the system. Let's move on and what I wanted to show you guys next was a quick unboxing of the package just so you're aware of what you get in the box. The PC comes packaged in a simple white box with a picture of it on the top and some specifications on the bottom. Nothing crazy, but it gets the job done. Sliding off the top cover, we get the mini PC itself which comes wrapped in a plastic sleeve. When doing unboxings for products, especially a product as costly as this, I'm always hoping to see some good protection material like foam or cushioning, but there was nothing of the sort. However, the cardboard was thick and sturdy. Then at the bottom, we've got a starter guide, including details of how to set it up in case you do need that info. After that, we've got an AC adapter and an HDMI cable. So you've got pretty much everything you need to get the mini PC powered up and connected to a display. Next, let's look at the specifications of the B-Link SCI-14. For the CPU, we've got an Intel Core Ultra 5 125H. I almost said Core i5 there. Great names by the way, Intel. But this is a Meteor Lake CPU, which is one of the reasons why I was looking forward to testing it because as some of you may know, Meteor Lake got cancelled for the desktop, so this gives me the opportunity to test out this architecture. This CPU, according to Intel's ARC website, has a total of 14 cores, consisting of 4 P cores with hyper-threading, 8 E cores, and 2 low-powered E cores for a total of 18 threads. Its P cores have a boost clock of up to 4.5 GHz, E cores at 3.6 GHz, and the low E cores at 2.5 GHz. It's also got 18 MB of cache, and and has a base power of 28 watts and has a max turbo power rating of up to 115 watts, though this is also dependent on how the OEM configures the chip for their machine. The CPU also has onboard ARC graphics with 7 Z cores and has a boost clock of 2.2 GHz for the GPU. The SCI-14 also comes with 32GB of DDR5 RAM running at 5600 MHz, and for storage, we have a 1TB NVMe drive, which is the crucial P3+. It's a Gen 4 drive with decent read and write speeds and no DRAM cache. 
There is also another M.2 Gen 4 slot available should you need to expand the storage. Now let's talk about its design and aesthetics. There's not much to say here as is typical with small mini PCs, as we're essentially dealing with a small square box. The sample I received is this space gray version, and I think it looks pretty nice, but you can tell this color scheme was very Apple inspired. If you stuck on an Apple sticker on the top, you could probably fool someone into thinking it's a Mac mini. But the overall design and the shape is quite simple, and yet it still looks and feels premium, probably due to its metal construction. Along with that, I do also like how it's got rounded corners, which is a nice touch to the overall smooth finish of the box. In terms of dimensions, it's 135 millimeters when it comes to its width and length, and is about 45 millimeters in height, which means it's got a very small footprint, you could even consider it to be portable. The sides of the mini PC continue on with the same smooth space gray finish, though what is concerning is the lack of ventilation, but we'll talk more about cooling in just a moment. On the front of the SEI 14, we've got the power and reset button, a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, a 10 gigabit per second type C port, and a USB 3.2 type A 10 gig port. Moving around to the rear, we see some vents for the airflow. Then we've got two USB 2.0 type A ports, a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, another USB A 3.2 port, a DisplayPort 1.4 connector, and an HDMI 2.0 port, along with a type C 40 gigabit Thunderbolt port. So down the road, if you decide to get an external GPU dock, you can utilize that with this PC. Then we've also got the DC in port for its power. Circling back to the design and in regards to ventilation, we've only had one area on the rear IO with vents, and then there's some holes at the bottom. B-Link are advertising the unit to come with a vapor chamber cooler so we're going to be putting that to the test and see how well it does when it comes to effectively dissipating heat. So speaking of testing, I guess it's time we moved on to our test results, but just before that, I did want to talk about the desktop experience and more specifically the OS install. So the SEI 14 comes preloaded with Windows 11, and I'm actually happy to report that it's a very clean install. There wasn't any bloatware at all, just the default Microsoft apps and Intel Arc drivers, and that's it. Everything else you see is stuff I installed for my testing. All right, so starting us off is Cinebench R23, where for our single core score, we attained 1,683 and 14,110 for the multi-core score. That's pretty impressive for a small form factor mini PC and this mobile chip. To put that into better perspective, that's about the same level as Intel's desktop Core i5-13400F. Moving on, and we've got Geekbench 6. Here, we're looking at a single core score of 2,202 and a multi-core score of 11,359 which for a mini PC, again, it's quite impressive to see what it's capable of. Up next, we have PC Mark 10, which makes the system go through a wide variety of scenarios, such as web browsing, video editing, spreadsheet analysis, and more. It evaluates how the system did in each test and gives you some final scores. Keep in mind the average overall score for this benchmark using their database is 5,401, and the B-Link SEI 14 scored 6,933. So that's 28% better than the average. Then if we look at the results more deeply at the various categories, we attained a score of 10,133 for the essential score, 8,927 for the productivity score, and 9,997 for the digital content creation score. Therefore, when looking at the variety of tasks from word processing, video editing, rendering, it is quite a capable system and one could daily drive it as an office machine without any problems. But speaking of real world testing, I actually decided to do some transcoding tests using Handbrake, and what I did was I took one of my final renders from a previous video of mine, in this case my review of the MSI Z790 Carbon Max Wi-Fi 2 motherboard, which I had rendered out in 4K 60fps using the HEVC codec, and I decided to transcode it to 1080p 60fps using AV1. I wanted to do this to showcase a more real-world scenario as opposed to doing a small two-minute gaming clip. This resulted in us getting a video file size that was significantly smaller, we where we went from 5 gigabytes to just 500 megabytes, and the video quality was surprisingly close. Obviously, there is degradation, the resolution is smaller, 4K obviously looks sharper, but if we can retain like 85% of the quality, while dropping down 90% in file size, I'll take it. As for our render time, the SEI 14 using CPU rendering managed 
to complete the task in about 24 minutes and 12 seconds, which isn't too bad. However, we can actually take that a step further and cut down on rendering times by utilizing the integrated art graphics and use the same transcode specs. The rendering times with that configuration was just 13 minutes and 3 seconds, which is almost half the time saved. So I am quite impressed with that. Therefore, when it comes to doing multitasking, office work, content creation, the SEI 14 is a very capable little system. And if you're someone who's looking for such a system that has a small footprint and is efficient, it'll check all of those boxes for you. But let's say you're someone who also likes to do some gaming on the side. Can the SCI 14 do any bit of gaming at all? It's got integrated graphics, and in the past when we looked at onboard graphics from Intel, they came nowhere close to the level that AMD was at. But with Arc, do they now have a competent iGPU? So to start us off, let's take a look at a synthetic 3D test, which is 3D Mark's Time Spy. For the overall score, we get 3,455. The GPU score is at 3,116, and the the CPU score is at 9025. So the CPU score is pretty decent. That's no surprise considering what we saw with all the rendering tasks. But what is on the lower end side is the GPU score, which is what the main driving force will be when it comes to gaming performance. Let's see how this translates to real world gaming performance. Now, if you're someone who mainly does work on their PC and likes to do some light gaming on the side, you don't care about new games or AAA games, you just want to play some indie games, which many of them are fairly light on graphics, then you'll be able to play plenty of titles without a problem. A fun little indie title I like to play is called Rampage Knights. It's a side-scrolling beat-em-up, and as you can see, the B-Link SEI 14 has absolutely no problems running it. But what if you do want to revisit some old classic games? Well, I tried Halo Reach, which I thought at the time looked phenomenal, and it's actually still holding up pretty well. So this will give you guys an idea of how this PC can handle older era titles from like the 360 era, and it did a pretty good job. Here you can see we're getting about 80 FPS on average, and considering the fact that when I had played this game originally, it was on the Xbox 360, which ran at like 30 FPS and I still had a blast, this is already a much better experience. So if you're a gamer who doesn't really care about new AAA games, but wants to go back and revisit some classics, then you'll be quite pleased with the performance here. When it comes to modern games, the B-Link SCI 14 did surprisingly decent. Now, granted, you'll have to face the reality that you're not going to be running this with maxed out graphics. You're going to have to be playing with low to medium quality settings, and you'll need to utilize upscaling. The first game that I tested is Baldur's Gate 3, and we're running with a mixture of low to medium settings, 1080p upscaled using FSR2 balanced, and we were able to attain an average FPS of around 46 frames per second and 26 FPS for the 1% lows, which for a turn-based strategy RPG game, I guess could be passable or playable. I haven't really spent too much time on this game, it is definitely on my list, but from what I could tell, if you're maybe just, you know, looking to continue on with some questing on the side while taking a bit of break from work, maybe this could end up working out for you just fine. You be the judge of that. Next, we have Forza Horizon 5, and even though it is about three years old at this point, in my opinion, it's still one of the best racing games we have, not just in terms of amusement, but also graphics. Using a mixture of medium and low settings, along with FSR2 balanced at 1080p, we were able to attain an average FPS of 52 and 40 for the 1% lows. And to me, that's definitely playable. Moving on, and we have Counter-Strike 2 at 1080p using medium and low settings. No upscaling here, just a native experience. And the mini PC does pretty well here. Obviously, you're not going to be competing with seasoned players on a machine like this. But if you're looking to perhaps just jump into some casual matches for some fun, play some arms race here and there, I can't see why you couldn't have an enjoyable experience. The next game we have on our list is Hogwarts Legacy. So this would be an example of a modern AAA game game with high fidelity visuals and is very demanding on hardware. With a mixture of medium and low settings and FSR2 set to performance, I was able to attain an average FPS of 45 and 27 for the 1% lows, which is better than what I had initially expected, and if you were to lock the FPS to 30 FPS, you'd be able to perceive a smoother experience, but the frame times also weren't as consistent but at the very least it can be passed off as playable depending on the individual, which for an iGPU does say a lot. 
The last game we have on our list is Cyberpunk 2077. Using low settings, 1080p FSR2 performance, and the performance is much worse than what we observed in Hogwarts Legacy. And that makes sense as I find this game to be superior graphically, but also more demanding as it's also larger and has a more denser world. So while we obtain a decent average frame rate at 40 FPS, the frame times were just way too inconsistent, resulting in a stuttering experience. So overall, this is a game that I just can't recommend playing on a system like this. But I don't want anyone to think that's a knock on the system. Again, you should really shouldn't be expecting to play this kind of game on a system like this. It's not really meant for that. Shifting away from our benchmarks, I wanted to take a look at thermals as well as give you guys an overview of power consumption. For thermals, I did a one hour stress test of IDA64 and during this test we saw the Intel Ultra 5 125H package temp spike to 90 degrees Celsius and hardware info recorded its peak at 93 degrees Celsius, but the thermal limit that was set in the BIOS is at 90 degrees Celsius. So we were starting to thermal throttle, hence you see the dips in the CPU temp as it it was pulling back the frequencies and that caused it to go down a little bit in temps and then it would push them back and then it was just back and forth. Now for a small form factor PC, that doesn't get the luxury to have a large tower cooler, this is to be expected. For those of you who have a thin and light laptop, I recommend you go try and run a heavy all-core stress test and you'll get similar results. That's just this trade-off that you make when you're dealing with a small form factor machine. The good thing though is that the cooling setup they have is effective at isolating and venting out all the heat from the CPU and this prevents other components within the system to experience high temps such as the memory and the SSD. You can see during the test, the temps were far below where the CPU was at and nowhere close to the point where any concerns would arise, so that's great. Then when it comes to power consumption, during our Cinebench runs, I decided to test total system power consumption straight off the wall using a watt meter, and you can see during our test, the system is pulling about 100 watts, and that's also utilizing the 65 watt mode. When it comes to gaming and during a heavy game like Hogwarts Legacy, which hits the CPU and the iGPU pretty hard, we can see temps around the mid 70s, which I'll emphasize size again for a small form factor PC like this it's not terrible oh, and when it comes to noise too it wasn't really noticeable with headphones on. And then for power consumption I tested this off the wall during a benchmark run of Cyberpunk 2077 and you can see total system wattage is around the same as what we got during Cinebench and this is because well Cyberpunk is a game that is very heavy on the CPU it is very multi-threaded but also we're now bringing the iGPU into the mix so that's why there isn't a huge difference or anything when it comes to the game scenario here. Alrighty guys, so that's pretty much going to cover everything I wanted to go over when it comes to B-Link's SCI 14 mini PC. Overall, I'm left quite impressed with the capabilities of this system, because in such a small form factor, you can do a lot of stuff with this kind of machine. There are so many different scenarios and applications where this machine could come in handy. It can be used as a small little office machine, you can edit videos on it, you can do some heavy rendering, along with that it's capable of doing some gaming, granted the user tempers their expectation. No, you're not going to be playing Cyberpunk 2077 at 4K with ray tracing, but if you were looking to perhaps jump into a couple of matches in Counter-Strike, maybe you wanted to play some 2D indie games like Terraria, Hades, or maybe you want to enjoy an older title, then this system is totally capable of handling all of that. So it's not like you can't find a way to utilize it for some entertainment. So if you're someone who's interested in setting up a mini PC that checks out those boxes, I highly recommend checking out the SCI 14 from B-Link. I'll have some links in the video description for you guys to check out, but for now that's going to do it for this one and we're going to touch base in the next one.